I am seeking, searching for the things this world has rejected, the things that are broken, that are flawed, thrown away and discarded. I seek the lost, the damaged, the forgotten things, the overlooked and the neglected, the things that have been pushed aside and left behind. Why? Why do I do this? Why chase after that which is despised by so many? It is because I have chosen the rejected. I bring restoration to the broken. I see beyond the flaws and the imperfections, and I bring new life to the lost. This world has called them useless and garbage, hopeless and unwanted. They have been scarred, abused, ignored, and unloved, but I, I have reclaimed them, and they belong to me now. They are my masterpiece, and I have a plan and a future for every single one. For I am crafting these dissonant and discarded pieces into something beautiful. church, go ahead and pull out your blue notes, or if you have a Bible app on your smartphone, the Version Bible app, find the events tab, and you'll find all the notes for what we're going to be talking about today. We're continuing in our series called This Is Just What We Do. This is what we do, and it surrounds a word that we use here at Hope called impact. In other words, all of us, if you claim to be a Christian, if you claim to be a follower of Christ, all of us have been designed to make an impact. You have been called to make a difference. So we've been looking at, hey, how do we do that? As followers of Jesus, how do we make an impact? And so today, I want to talk about a method of sharing Christ's love that happens formally around here quite a bit, but it also happens informally in your everyday lives. And we have labels for it. We call it words like outreach. Other things you hear around here, we call it serve Saturdays. Uh, still, if we real, really want to be, feel real spiritual, we call it servant evangelism. You know, it's when we did formally, when we handed out 5,000 water bottles uh, for free at the local 4th of July, or it happens when we've done leaf raking in the past, or hot chocolate handouts in the past. We've done free car washes, free gift wrapping. You know, we've helped, our, our men's group has helped with building projects. Uh, many of you have cleaned Safe Park or Safe Haven. And even last, last week, summer blast, all that stuff that went on was meant as an outreach. So right around 275 kids were registered last week. 175 of those kids, 175 of them, don't even call Hope their church home. So it was an outreach-focused event. And many may stop and wonder why. You know, wh why do we do all this stuff? Is it just some ploy, you know, to introduce people to our church? Is it just a, a marketing deal so that we look good? So today we're going to talk about why we serve our community. Why is it so important? Why does it need to actually be more prominent in our church life than it is today? Why should it be even more of, hey, this is just what we do? So some years back, I uh, attended a, a conference, it was a pastor's and a, a leader's conference, and it was labeled, it was called, How to Become More of an Outreach-Focused Church. And as pastors there, there's this thing we learned about us, and we kind of know, and I would say it, it's, it goes to you if you're kind of a well-established Christian. We would like to think that as we improve on things here and what's going on in the church that people outside of the church well they're just going to decide to come they're just going to say "Ooh, i want to go and see that we think you know we have something pretty good here you know we're offering something that's pretty well done and and we step back and we think we just can't figure out why aren't people wanting to come 
Well, the very opening talk of this conference, the, the lead speaker and, and the pastor was a seasoned pastor. Uh, his name is Steve Shogren. He said this right away. No matter how well you think you're doing, no matter how polished you are, no matter how well your programs or music are all about, people out there are not looking for your church. He said, nobody is looking for your church. And you're thinking, wow, thanks for that encouragement right away. But then he explained, he says, why? He says, because the unchurched, those who aren't going to church, they think that church is irrelevant. They think the church has nothing to offer them. So guess what? This morning I am passing on to you that same exact message, Hope family. The people in this community, the people of the Shano area, are not looking to come through these doors. New building or not, great programs like we had this week or not, they're not looking for it. Do you realize that the church of Jesus has been growing at a rate of over 9% a year? But do you realize that that growth mostly or mainly occurs in Asia or South America or Africa? God is at work in our world. But the church in America, some might say, grows at maybe 1%. And we see the growth of many of these huge churches, mega churches. And I think the mega church is great. They, they do a great job benefiting the body of Christ today. They're a great resource for that. But many of, that, of their growth comes from transfer growth from other churches. And so we have this feeling that, hey, we're growing, but we're not. We need to, to pay attention to those words from that pastor, nobody is looking for your church. See, our, our culture is changing. Fewer and fewer people today have been raised in the church. More and more people think of it, it's a special ceremony. You know, they do at weddings or funerals or holidays. Church isn't part of everyday lives. They, they either have gotten burned by the church or they just don't see it offering anything important to them. A few years ago, I was uh, in, at SeaWorld in Florida, and it might have been a Sunday morning, so you have to forgive me for that. I wasn't in church. Um, and and I, I'm sitting there watching this, you know, the killer whale, whale show, and I don't know what they're doing now, but they had these big, huge, monstrous, you know, TV screens, probably bigger than that, that, that came out, you know, before the killer whales jumped up, and they were moving. You know, there's they're these motion moving things. And I had a thought to myself, hmm, Sunday morning, I can't, I can't compete with that. Little League tournaments on Sunday morning, I, I can't compete with that. The lake, when it's a beautiful day, and the boat and the jet skis, I can't compete in that. When it comes to just entertainment. Now, I think what we offer here is more, can be more exciting than that, because it's the worship of God. It's experiencing the presence of God when we all come in together. But people aren't looking for that. Now, think about the life of Jesus. When Jesus started his ministry, did he, he was a carpenter, you know, he, did he just build a big building and expect all these people to come fill it up? No, he went out and he met with people. And then he met their needs, and then he taught them about the kingdom of God. He let them see it. He showed it to them. The apostles in the upper room, they had this great Holy Spirit moment. Did they just hang a revival sign outside and say, hey, Holy Spirit moment, come and see? No, they were compelled to go out. Share the gospel, the message of the kingdom. So, so, so why are you and I any different? Many of us think in this older model, kind of like the old movie Field of Dreams, if we build it, they will come, right? We need to adopt a new, a, a new motive of, of not come and see, but go and show. So this morning I want us to talk about that. Just, I want to talk about five principles around this. Five principles for effectively sharing Jesus in our community. Five principles of why we do our outreach events. Five reasons why we need to go out there, just so you can understand we're not just doing it for as a marketing ploy, but we do it because there's a reason behind it. 
So I want to give credit where credit is due. There's a great book. It's in the back side of your notes. If you don't own this book, you need to. Conspiracy of Kindness by Steve Shogren. In my 20 years of ministry, this is one of the top five books that I've read. So I have the reference for you to encourage you to get it. So number one, here's the first principle. When I serve, when I go out and serve people, I treat people like they're friends. So I want to look at one of my favorite passages in the New Testament. So if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 9, this morning. You might recall this story as Jesus interacts with Matthew. Jesus was walking along, and starting at verse 9, and he saw a man named Matthew sitting in a tax collector's booth, and he said, follow me and be my disciple. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciple, why, disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Verse 12, when Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy and not sacrifice, for I have, not, for I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who think they are sinners. Why didn't the Pharisees have an impact on their community back then? Because they didn't want to associate with anybody who didn't look like them, sound like them, or dress like them. Matter of fact, they turned them away. Jesus, how can you eat with such scum? That's nice, inviting words, isn't it? Why do you think the lost people stay away from the church today? Many times it's because they think they're going to get hit over the head and have to look a certain way, act a certain way, behave a certain way before they can even come in the door. So let's take this story, put it in modern terms. Who would be Jesus take who who would Jesus take the supper today? Bishop, a cardinal, our own regional president. Oh, for sure Jesus would want to go out to eat with Billy Graham, right? And despite Jesus' love for each and every one of those people, I believe Jesus would be spending time with the struggling single mom or the teen addict, or the ones getting ready to get checked in at Shawano County? Would you find Jesus at Perkins, or would you find him at the shack? <laughs> That's the bar next to the paper mill. Why did Jesus spend time with those people? Because Jesus generally cared about them, and he wanted them to get to know him. And to do that, he sat down and, and he shared a meal. He, he ate. In other words, he wanted to develop friendships. And back then, when you sat down, you know this, to eat a meal, you were saying, hey, I want to know you. It wasn't inviting Matthew into some religious program. It was about a relationship. So Jesus treated people like friends. And I'm still processing this. I'm still learning about this through experience. I've learned, though, that it has been necessary to live in Shano for 20 years to develop relationships, because Shano is a community of relationships. And so slowly, you earn to speak the right into people's lives. I've been here 20 years, and I'm still an outsider. Those of you who lived in Shano, and maybe second or third generation, you're in. The rest of us, we're out. But it takes time serving, developing relationships, developing friendships in order to give and speak the right of, into someone's life. You and I are called to develop friendships. But here's the deal, church. In order to invite, and it's okay, you need to invite your friends to church, but in order to invite a friend to church, guess what you have to have first? You have to have a friend. And so many of us... Don't have friends outside the church. You need to have friends outside the church. So you can share with them, so you can speak into their lives. Second principle for effectively sharing Jesus is this. When I serve, so when I'm serving somebody, hearts are touched. Look with me, familiar verse we read. Many times we read it around communion Sundays like today. Your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. Rather, he made himself nothing. He took on a humble position of a slave and appeared in human form. And in human form, he obediently himself even further by dying a criminal's death on the cross. This, this passage is familiar. Jesus 
humbly came to earth and humbly sacrificed his life. And we were like, oh, wow, Jesus, that's awesome. But we missed the context of that in the first few words. It says, your attitude. That's what Paul is trying to talk about. Look with me in verse 3. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for your own interests, but take an interest in other people. Then he says, be like Jesus. Your attitude should be like Jesus. Jesus humbled himself as king of the universe, as creator of the universe, and came and served. That ought to blow our minds. There's a marvelous story about a four-year-old child who woke up one night. She was frightened, convinced that in the darkness, you know, as little kids do, that there's boogeymen and monsters all over. So she ran into her parents' room. Her mother calmed her down, taking by her hand, led her back into her own room where she turned on the, the light and reassured the child with the words, you needn't be afraid. You are not alone here. God is in this room. And the child said, I know God is here. But I need someone in this room who has some skin. Isn't that what we cry out for? God, I I know you're here, but ah, somehow I wish you were closer. I wish that there was somebody closer with some skin. And, And the miracle of the incarnation is Jesus came, God came down to us with skin. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. But the further miracle is God calls you to be skin. Literally, the body of Christ. Ronald Rollheiser writes in his book, Holy Longing, he says, we are the body of Christ. He writes this, this is not an exaggeration. This is not a metaphor. Paul, in particular, never tells us that the body of believers replaces Christ's body or represents Christ's body or it's even Christ's mystical body. He says, we are the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, all of you together are Christ's body. Each one of you is a part of it. You today are Jesus' skin. For the world to see. And so when I serve, When I act like Jesus and I humble myself and I go out, not just come and see, but when I go out and go and show and serve somebody, they get to see Jesus. And you know what happens? You know what happens when someone serves you, don't you? When someone really, like, gives something of themselves, your heart is softened. Which is this, you can be having a terrible day and you get great customer service at a store or a restaurant and you're just like, Wow, that just made my day. I mean, you get terrible customer service, right? It turns you off. But when someone does something for you, calls you up out of the blue, comes over and sees you, takes a meal to you, does something for you, it softens your heart. The same thing happens out there when we are trying to share Jesus. A lot of times we think, okay, i got to have this all memorized just right. Many times we just need to go and serve them. And their heart's going to be softened so they can hear truth later. One of the doctors I saw years ago for the uh, health condition that I had, he was the chief of neurosurgery at the University of Chicago. So not a small, small guy. He was a Harvard grad, whole nine yards. And you know, in most cases back then when I was seeing him, if I were to email him, within a day or two, he would email me back personally. I was like, guy doesn't have to do that but he did he humbled himself enough to serve what did that do it 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 just it's a feel-good moment it's it softens my heart so when you serve it softens your heart number three third principle write this down when i serve i redefine the perceptions of god so back in jesus day the perceptions of god you know this were all skewed right They thought, you know, it was about rules, regulations, rituals, and so God was seen as one big rule book. And it wasn't like the rules were bad. They just didn't understand the reason behind the rules. They didn't understand behind the God behind the rules. And if you think about it today, isn't that where so many people are at when they think of church? You know, if you were to ask, you know, what does it take to, to go to heaven, the most common answer people would give you is, well, I hope my, the, the good things that I do outweigh the bad things that I do. In other words, what are they doing? We're keeping track of the rules here. 
And I, I know I've said this to you so many times, but it happens to me so often. I'll be hanging out with people in the community, just rubbing shoulders with neighbors or, or, or friends from different leagues or whatever, and you know, a word, a swear word comes out of their mouth, and the first thing that they do is they look at me. I'm so sorry. Many of you do that too. Oh, pastor, sorry. Oh, my word, I've never heard that word before. That thought, that word has never come into my head, sinner. We think it's rules. We need to change people's perception of who God is. And the way we do it is through serving. I love the account in, in Matthew chapter 22. You, you know the story. There's this, the Pharisees are trying to trick Jesus. And it says the Pharisees, uh, you know, and and. And Sadducees came up to Jesus, and, and the person who was an expert in the religious law said, Teacher, tell us what the most important commandment of the law of Moses. So, hey, we're all about the rules, Jesus. We got hundreds of rules. So I want you to tell me what number one is. Look with me, verse 37. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That's the first and greatest commandment. The second, equally important, love your neighbors as yourself. All the other rules, all the demands of the prophets and the rule writers, it's just those two things. He's, he's, he's changing perception of God. God is not up in heaven with a checklist. God is up in heaven saying, do you love me? And if you love me, are you showing that love to other people? That's it. Jesus gave a reason for the rules. And once again, Jesus just didn't say, <laughs> I'm going to tell you what love's all about. Jesus demonstrated love. And how did he go out and show them? He demonstrated by giving of his life. Sacrificing his life. Today, people's perceptions are so warped. Every time we go out and serve, we're saying, we want to change your perception of who God is. A lot of times when we go out and serve in many, in many different ways, people would, would ask us and, and say, why are you doing this? And we teach people, we tell people when they go out and serve with us in group activities, we just say simple things like, you know what? We think if Jesus was walking along the earth today, he would do stuff like this. So many people have such limited contact with the church today, like Christmas and Easter for feel-good moment or they go to a, a funeral and, and so many you know they don't even go to weddings anymore they go to wedding receptions but they don't go to wedding ceremonies anymore we need to be holy spirit agents of change number four this is why we serve when i serve i do the message before i speak the message Did you catch that i do the message before i speak the message what if god now i, I know we have our bibles you know, and, and we open our Bibles and it's words, but what if all it was was just God telling us what to do? Do you know your Bible is not just God telling you what to do? The Bible is full of stories of how God went and showed us. He went and demonstrated love, not just telling you what to do. Yes, Jesus came to speak. He came to preach the message of salvation, but it was wrapped in ultimate service. John 1.14. So the word, words, God's revelation of himself, became human and lived on earth among us. He was filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. Verse 16. We've all benefited from that, from this rich blessing. He brought us one gracious blessing after another. It wasn't just a sermon on the mount. You've heard me say this. I, I believe our communities are tired of just hearing about it. If, if they wanted to hear God's word, it'd be standing room only every Sunday, right? I believe we leave, live in a community that still has spiritual aspirations, but they're confused because they have misperceptions of who God is. And so, church family, we're the skin of Jesus. Or to change those misperceptions. We need to look for opportunities to serve our neighbors, to serve our friends. And, and, and maybe it's bringing over some dessert. Maybe it's, it's raking their leaves or cleaning their gutters. Or, or maybe, ooh, you got to babysit their kids. 
It's being Jesus, because that opens the door, that softens hearts. If, if I were to ask you, you know, think of somebody in, uh, you know, in the last hundred years who really served, well, the name that would come to many of our minds would be Mother Teresa, wouldn't it? Influence of how she served. Tony Campolo described Mother Teresa's appearance once when she went to Harvard University and spoke at one of their chapels. And when she went in there, she didn't pull any punches. At one point, she said this, I understand that there are lots of you students in this school who are doing things that displease God. You're harming yourself and offending God. You're drinking alcohol. You're taking drugs. Others of you are engaged in sexual sin of many sorts. I have a message for you from God. Repent and turn from what you're doing. The result of that talk was amazing. The entire auditorium full of people rose to their feet and applauded, applauded her for several minutes. They gave a little simple woman an ovation for telling them, you, you're sinning, you got to turn, you need to repent. Because her serving gave her credibility to speak. She did the gospel before she shared the gospel. Number five. This is also true. You can't ignore this. But when I serve, I need to be ready. I need to be ready to speak. I need to be ready to share. Jesus wasn't just a nice man who did some good things. He was the very son of God who spoke truth into people's lives. He proclaimed that he was the only way for people to have a relationship with God. John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It was a message, it was understood loud and clear, so loud and clear that they wanted to kill him. Jesus made it clear, I am the hope of the world. So as we, church family, live out this message, as you live out this message and serve your neighbors and serve your coworkers, serving in and of itself is not just enough. If that were so, people would just think, oh, that's, that's, those are nice people. Oh, oh, hope, yeah, that's a nice church. They do nice things. If we do that, the focus will be in ourselves. Every time we look to share, we take the focus off ourselves and put it on the gospel of Jesus. There's a verse, many of you know it. It describes it. Peter, who hung out with Jesus, who got it, said this, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So in other words, what was going on back then? There was some good behavior happening. So much so that people would ask them, hey, why are you doing that? What's going on? Why does your life look different? Peter says, always be ready to share. And what does he say? To share what? Do you have to have, you know, a Wayne Grudem's theology book open and say, hey, you know, I'm going to photocopy this chapter. It's on justification by faith. You need to read it. Is that what he says? Just always be ready to share your hope. In other words, are you ready to share your story, your faith story? No one can argue your faith story. No one can argue the difference Jesus has made in your life. So be ready for that. Have a plan for that. Some of you may need to write it out and share it with a couple Christian friends to make sure you know it's okay. But be ready to share your story because it's the gospel of Jesus. It's sharing the truth of who he is that's going to change somebody's heart, change somebody's mind, excuse me, then their heart, then their life. And the thing is, the whole context of what Peter is saying is, is you better be living out your message, though, first. So do it with gentleness and respect. You're going to have some good behavior. Don't, don't have bad behavior and then say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. <laughs> it's not just being about nice. 
It's about saying, hey, the only reason why you're experiencing any goodness for me, any goodness in my actions, any goodness from our church, the only reason why you guys get to watch this crazy video of people doing crazy things. Do you know, in, in our summer blast, it's an evening program. Many of you don't know this. It's an evening program. So we have people who work hard all day long, and then they come here, and they get full of mud and sweat and water and pudding and ugh. And they just go, okay, I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to get up at 6 in the morning and go back to work and come back. And I'm going to do that four days in a row. And I know she would really yell at me for telling you this. But I got here early. I just got to the church early. And it was around 5.30 this morning. And Cindy, who does our cleaning, was still cleaning. Because there's pudding on all the stalls in the bathroom. (laughs) Yeah. Why do we do all of that? Because it creates an opportunity to share the gospel. And Richie, our kids director, shares the gospel. It opens a child's heart. to say, I want to come to church. It's a fun place to be. And while they're here, they hear the gospel. Well, here's what I know around today's message. It's easy to preach. It's easy to say, yes, amen. We need to go out and serve. We need to make sacrifices. We need to befriend our neighbors. You know, we can get motivated. We can get pumped up. We need to go do this. We need to be Jesus. Yes. But it's so hard to do, isn't it? Maybe we'll do it once or twice because we kind of got pumped up. But to consistently do it day in, day out, the only way you can do that is if you day in, day out remember Jesus. And that's why this message fits on a communion Sunday. Because the only way we can go out and serve is if we remember how much Christ served us. That's our motivation from within. It's not a checklist. It's about me remembering what Jesus did and as that impacts my life, then it's just a natural outflow. Of course, of course I want to love other people. So today, during communion, let this be a time to reflect on Christ's service for you. But here's here's what I want you to do. As we enter into time around the bread and the cup, I I, I don't want us, I, I want you to remember Christ's sacrifice for you, and then I want you to pray a very specific prayer. I want you to pray, God, bring to mind somebody in my life that I can be skinned for. You know what I'm getting at? So Jesus, you made this sacrifice for me. You served me. So Jesus, I want you to put somebody in my mind that I need to serve and spend some time around that. Flood my mind, Jesus, with how I can reach them for you. This morning, I want to invite our communion servers to come forward, and as they do, let me explain to you, if you're visiting, what communion looks like here at Hope. First, communion is open to everyone here uh, who has said yes to Jesus. If you said yes to Jesus, you believe he's the Son of God, and he's the Savior in, in your life, please, we invite you to participate with us. And then what we'll do here at Hope is we'll ask you to come up and receive the bread and the cup, and we ask you to take that back to your seat And you can either pray with some friends and share with some friends or share with your family, parents. You know, we encourage you to talk about some of the things we talked about today. Take some time and spend with them. And then partake when you're ready. There won't be any prompting from up front. And while this is all going on, Jared and the team here is going to be leading us in worship. And you know why they lead us in worship during this time? So we don't check out. (laughs) So we can remember what Christ has done for us. So this morning, I want to read out of the same book, in the book of Matthew. I want to read Jesus' words and what he did. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. And he broke it in pieces and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, for this is my body. And he took a a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to each of them and said, Each of you drink from it. For this is my blood, which confirms the new covenant between God and his people. It's poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Jesus, we pause today to remember your serving, your sacrifice. And as we remember that, Jesus, may our hearts be filled with gratitude. That no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, Jesus, you gave your life for us. God, I pray that that you would use that also today 
to motivate for us to give our lives for others. Amen.